All right, hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for for joining us today. I'm uh, I'm very happy, very excited to be your your host and your moderator for the for this panel today. Uh, we have the chance to have a, a very diverse group of uh, of speakers with us, uh, coming from so many different backgrounds, but all very complementary. Um, Sebastian Bourget, who uh, uh, will. Uh, Will join us in a second. Uh, if I'm sure you guys all know the sandbox, uh, it's been hard to to miss uh, over the past few months. Sebastian is one of the co-founder and uh, the CEO of the sandbox. We have uh, James, uh, who's a, a, a James Wu in China, big investor in uh, in the in the space. Feng Han, who will join us as well, uh, who's a, uh, an academic and uh, and uh, and. Uh, and running a, a very large, a very uh, ambitious DAO, and uh, Bruno Skvork, uh, who will uh, runs a, a very interesting protocol, uh, very advanced NFT protocol, who will be uh, able to uh, to introduce all. Of, I, I I would like to start with uh, with you guys to being able to to uh, get the opportunity to introduce yourself very quickly, uh, what you what you guys are doing, and then we'll uh, we'll jump right in the the topics today. Uh, and, uh, and to talk about building better world, the metaverse, and uh, all the opportunities. Uh, Br Bruno, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Bruno. Um, I used to work at the Web3 Foundation as a technical educator and started the Remark Protocol um, in 2019 as a, as a side project. And then it kind of evolved into its own thing. The gist of it is that I was, I was sick of um, NFTs just being images. And so I figured that if you just unlearn that they're images and, and realize that uh, an NFT is anything uniquely identifiable, and then um, think of it as a rows of data that you can cryptographically prove that you own, it kind of opens a whole new world of things. And so I developed a system of five elementary NFT Legos that when you put them together, you can compose any system of arbitrary complexity nonetheless supported by any UI that integrates these standards and any derivation and permutation of these Legos is also automatically supported, which means that you get a much more robust and much more versatile set of NFT functionality out of the box without having to develop custom smart contracts for them. Um, which is the case right now with, with a lot of these where you kind of have um, an NFT project and then a team kind of has to develop a special UI for it and then you kind of re rely on them and only them to keep that alive, to keep that UI around, to, to keep that functionality around and so on. Like for example, the, the Bored Apes Club, uh, Club uh, Mutant Serum, you can't really use that anywhere else other than on their UI and the effect, even if you do manage to burn the, the, the serum, um, the effect is just not going to be applied the same because they need to generate that image for you and upload it for you. So um, this this kind of pushes the needle in, in like this direction of fully versatile and, and infinitely customizable NFTs that I can just go over briefly later. Um, but essentially, it, just, it was born out of frustration with the simplicity of NFTs today and, and it just takes them further. I love I love there are always so many different reasons to uh, to start a new venture. Uh, out of frustration is a uh, is, is is uncommon, but it's uh, it's exciting what comes out. Thank you very much, um, James. Can you uh, can you please give us a little bit of your background? Uh, you're a big investor in this space. Oh uh, sure, happy to. So hello everyone. This is James Wolf from DFG. So I basically started this investment vehicle uh, back to 2015. Uh, right now we manage more than a billion dollar. Uh, uh, with investment in the equity uh, layer one protocol and different application and uh, you know are, are kind of uh, in different sector like DeFi, NFT, metaverse, gaming, like everything. Uh, we've been invested into more than a hundred different projects uh, in different ecosystems. So we are very long term believers for for the crypto space and especially uh, uh, you know huge believer for metaverse and NFT as well. So yeah, that that's me and the things. Thank you. I will uh, <clears throat> maybe I will give the Sebastian the uh, the opportunity to uh, to introduce himself a bit later when he when he can join us. But uh, maybe to to put some context because I've known Sebastian for some times. Uh, I'm I'm pretty we 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 have the chance to uh, 
to be pretty close to each other as we're, we're both in Paris. Sebastian is the, the co-founder of the Sandbox. The Sandbox is the this uh, a massive metaverse platform right now that is built around the uh, decentralization and, uh, and user-generated content. Um, and uh, he uh, he will give you probably more data about it, but I think the, the, the numbers uh, that you can read right now in the press speak for themselves. So, so very happy to have you all here. Uh, the point of today's conversation is going to be a conversation and, and not really me trying to always uh, ask you guys specifically for, for your own opinion, but let's try to make it uh, like a conversation, like if we're all grabbing a coffee and, uh, and discussing this in a kind of like laid back way. Um, the, what, we're, what we're willing to discuss about today is what is going to be the, the path to uh, um, really evangelize and, and, and get the mass, the mass community, the mass market to join and to and to participate to this open metaverse. Uh, the open metaverse is a is a is a thesis that is a, that is a very uh, that matters a lot for uh, for for a lot of uh, for a lot of us here. And so uh, I would like to uh, to start uh, a little bit by talking about this and maybe maybe uh, asking a little bit to each of you. Uh, how you guys would define what's the open metaverse? And I don't want to get into the definition of the metaverse because I think this is uh, already too confusing and people already have so many different ones. But but this idea of, a, of an open metaverse that keeps you know coming back and back and then with companies like Animoca Brands and how do you guys define that? Let's start with uh, with you, James. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think it's a great idea. So what, what metaverse or open metaverse is interesting is like, a, you know, um, there's like an idea in the first space, like a uh, centralized finance, you got a finance industry, and you got a DeFi, which is kind of like a, make the finance industry decentralized. Then it's easy to understand that, you know, um, there's like a, some, some, something you can compare, right? So if uh, it's financial industry, then you make it decentralized, then, then it's DeFi. And and uh, people, you know, uh, work in the DeFi space, then it, it's very easy for what is DeFi, right? But for metaverse that, you know, even in the traditional industry without a crypto, without a blockchain, it hasn't been proved that it's a really a, a, a mature industry. So it's really hard to define what is really the things we can build on our metaverse. And w w which means it's very interesting, you can basically do everything. So in the, you know, in the financial industry, you, you got like an insurance, you got, you know, um, you got banks, you got exchange, you got basically the, the, the security, you got, you, got, you got everything there already being there. You just make it decentralized. So it's very easy for you to have idea and build on top of, top of that. So it, it's really, you know, the, the case in the industry as well, like uh, a unit swap is building on DAX and they make it out every discount building on, building on landing protocols. There's other DYDX that are built on derivative tradings. So it's very, you know, uh, easy for them to find a solution about what to build. But for metaverse, since there's no kind of uh, things to compare, so it's really a very new, in, uh, new uh, I would say, sector that, uh, you know, basically don't have a clear picture yet. So w which also means that, y you know, we all agree that this could be a, a trillion dollars of, of market and no one have the clear path about what to do, which probably, mm -hmm. you know, can result in that, you know, a metaverse in the crypto industry become probably the, even the, the largest amount, amount, amount even, even bigger than a traditional industry, right? So, you know, the other is like, a, you know, you got to compare to them and take it gradually and try to beat them in the long term. The, the things here in the crypto industry in the metaverse is like, a, you try to build something very, very new and just, take over the market. So it's 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 totally different idea. So that that is my understanding about you know you know why metaverse should be big in the future and uh, you know why why it should be very very open and uh, why uh, how is the metaverse will be in the future. If I if I focus a bit more the, the question uh, specific to, to you Bruno like I could phrase it a bit differently. What, what do you think is the difference between the metaverse and the open metaverse, or what what defines it as this uh, openness? Yeah. Um, so there's there's different. Um, I think it's really important to understand the difference between a multiplayer game and the metaverse. 
um, what we see today uh, in 99% of the cases is not a metaverse. A metaverse is open and does not run on anybody's one server that can go down and disappear with everything you have. Additionally, every single metaverse out there right now has the same problem. And that is that they use NFTs as access tokens and nothing else. And so you have this one centralized client being developed by one centralized company that actually is just a game in which you have certain assets like a glowing sword. And if you have the glowing sword NFT in your wallet, what that client, what that application does is when you log into it with your Web3 wallet, it will check your balance for that glowing sword. And then it will allow your in-game avatar to access that asset that is already in the game. Now, this has several problems. One is that I can sell the sword while I'm using it because it is not bound blockchain-wise to any kind of um, scarcity in terms of the virtual space. So like this sword can be used in one location and I can log into another game with the same address, use it in another location. Um, but also additionally, you have to communicate with a centralized entity to make these models that are compatible with these metaverses, AKA multiplayer games in this case, because without them, you can't really import new assets into this game. It's not possible. They have to make an asset that is compatible with their engine and it can be imported into their engine. Well, not they, but somebody who does these assets and who has the ability to put them into the game. Um, so, so, so just to, to make sure I, we understand exactly where you're going, you're, what you're saying is that by definition, a metaverse has to be open. So there's, there's no open metaverse. Every metaverse I'm, should be an open yeah, metaverse. I'm saying, no, not, 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 not exactly. I'm saying a metaverse should have ownership of experience in that you and your experiences are not logged to somebody's server and can go away. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean full openness where you're allowed to do anything at any time, uh, because obviously that doesn't make sense in, in, in most cases. Um, but you have to own your experience. And this is why, for example, with having, uh, let's say you have a board Ape uh, NFT. If you turn that into an avatar in some, in some 3D environment, um, that avatar is, that 3D avatar is in no way connected to that NFT, in no way. Um, you are using your, uh, your board Ape NFT as a permission slip to activate that avatar in the game. They're not connected in any way. Uh, this is the limitation that I'm talking about. And so any experience that your avatar has in that universe is bound to that universe alone. And it cannot take it out of it. And you have the same problem you have right now with you know, the various MMORPGs and similar. When they disappear, your character disappears, your experience disappears, everything. We are focusing sure. a little bit too much on gaming here, but this applies to a lot of things. So you have to have ownership of experience. I would, I would love to, uh, to hear uh, Sebastian's opinion on that because, of course, it's, uh, it, it must resonate a lot with, uh, with, what, with what Sandbox is doing. I, I actually agree a lot with uh, all the things you've said. Like, ultimately, the goal will be to have uh, the NFT in a self-hosted, decentralized manner, not only on the data storage or the uh, storing of like the ownership, the authorship of the storage CC, but also in all the permission rights and the way that smart contracts allows to interact across multiple uh, decentralized applications. That's uh, like the long way uh, vision of full decentralization that uh, should uh, be implemented and hopefully should be supported by all the decentralized world over time. I guess what we're living right now is like it's an MVP uh, version of the overall vision of the open metaverse. And it has to start somewhere to be accessible. Uh, and the first step of that somewhere is already to allow uh, the usage of um, uh, user uh, NFT or 3D assets or 2D assets or any form of representation of those assets in other application than uh, into um, one single application where those uh, content all originally emerged from. That's what uh, I would say the MVP version of interoperability is uh, proposing it. And so far, I haven't seen that. It, it's a lot of effort all by itself. It's an effort like in content production, like because you have to naturally, if the asset is not uh, produced already in a format that can be represented anywhere, and it's hard to produce content for any future uh, location where it could be applied. That means that the client would decide to implement um, interoperability have to do that work and we're at that stage i think that's the next stage that's uh will be coming where 
uh, NFTs will be coming into so many different formats originally from their creator that it will be requiring less, uh, of, less of this kind of uh, content production effort from the application who want to implement uh, interoperability. The ownership is really tied, as you said, as uh, to this notion of access right. I think like it's very the very first form of manifestation. I own something, so I have the right to use it. I do not you own something. I do not have the right to use something. However, do I have the right to use it into one single instance of an application where I am versus multiple instance of application where I am? The metaverse is also being is is being is about being ubiquitous. It's about having your avatar able to cross multiple worlds, have to present into on multiple uh, virtual world and have that identity. It's never been said that that identity cannot be present at one other application while it is at one simultaneously leveraging the same NFT you own. It's still your yeah, ubiqu ubiquity. ubiquity. Uh, but th this is very debatable. I mean, like we're building something new, something that so far I've never seen implemented at scale. And this is a, a very interesting discussion to have and think through there. So it's a, it, it, it <clears throat> I have a series of questions, but actually, uh, as uh, as I want to keep it as a as a discussion, I, I'm I'm trying. I would like to kind of uh, uh, piggyback on that. So I was uh, I was listening to uh, the I think the the, the CEO of uh, Delphi Delphi Digital recently, and um, he was saying something very interesting, which is that he was basically saying decentralized decentralization starts like as a as a as a. It was not necessarily created. He, he was quoting the. The white paper of uh, of Satoshi Nakamoto, Nakamoto, and and saying that basically decentralization was brought to the Bitcoin protocol uh, to avoid censorship, uh, and not really because it was a, a, a like a benefit in itself, and that it was actually more bringing more constraints than 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 benefit. And so when I, when I listen to you guys, uh, I, I hear also a lot of people right now who are obviously very interested about true ownership and digital ownership of uh, or ownership of digital rights there uh, uh, about composability, all these opportunities that come through decentralization, but it kind of triggers the question in a way that is decentralization uh, necessary, specifically when we think of the, uh, the metaverse and, or, you know, or is it just, uh, is it, is it, is it, to, to, is it a goal or is it a goal to achieve eventually? Um, what do you guys think? Like, do you think that it's a it's a core pillar that has to be protected? What's you know at at all costs, or um, it's just one way of doing it? Um, James, what's uh, what's your opinion on that? You have a uh, you're you're not you're not deep down in the uh, uh, doing execution here, so I guess you have a bit more of a a bit more distance on the topic. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's a great question. For for my understanding, it's a hundred percent necessary here. Otherwise, without decentralization, I don't think there's not a point about using crypto or uh, the blockchain, you know, uh, overall. Um, uh, you know, what, what I also view this is like uh, once Satoshi, whoever she or he is, uh, when created Bitcoin, because the background is like uh, in 2018, the there's a financial crisis. So, I mean, for Bitcoin being created at, uh, you know, in, in 20, 2009, I think the initial thoughts is not about, you know, not about, uh, decentralization, not about a lot of things. It's just about, you know, creating a, a currency that was a fixed amount of, you know, total supply and uh, no one can change it. So that's the initial thought, right? Because the Federal Reserve bring too much like a uh, fi uh, fiat and, you know, it, it create a problem. So this is something, you know, I think the, the very simple initial thought about, about Bitcoin. Limited but, supply. Well, yeah, just, just control the supply. No one can, you know, creating, you know, more currencies by themselves for a different kind of purpose. So that's a very initial and a simple reason why Bitcoin is created. And later on, when people, you know, uh, when an industry like developer in the past 10 years, then people realize that it's really important to own your own asset. Then, you know, decentralization is really the way for people to own their own asset. So that's why the industry exists and why the industry become much better. What, what we do here is really just try to, um, you know, build a very solid infrastructure 
And eventually, build a, you know, end user application, uh, make sure make everything kind of very usable and make it decentralized. So once we have these two things together, uh, they can replace the, you know, the application in our daily life in, in the Web2 world. That's, I think, the eventually uh, the, the, the vision of, of the crypto and uh, the vision of the blockchain industry. So it's actually, you know, uh, uh, gradually people understand that, but I think decentralization is actually the, the things which is 100% necessary in, in our industry and also in, in the whole world, I guess. Well, well Sebastian, so you, you guys have been yes. through different steps, right? You, you guys didn't start from the get-go being, so being decentralized and uh, you, you, you eventually moved there. Actually, we experienced the same at, at Dawes and our game Life Beyond, so it's, uh, uh, we've been through the similar process. What is your, what is your view on that? Well, my view is like, and you've been rightly pointed out, like most uh, uh, games um, uh, that claim to be like virtual world, they are actually just on the uh, MMORPGs. And MMORPGs or, or games, we've seen that for 25 years. We've seen the model where everything is centralized, everything is actually at the risk that, uh, well, you could lose by one day all the content, all the values that have been created, or even worse, like all the value. Uh, and content created in the form of uh, or the value created by users in the form of content or in the form of presence and uh, activities is actually not is all going and all accruing towards one single central entity, which is like the operator of the platform, the developer of the platform. We've been there before as well, as like, mm -hmm. and it's been a major source of frustration in a way like. We found like it's very hard to retain credit over long term, and I'm talking about years. I'm talking about decades. If you do not provide the right incentive, passion, rec social recognition, they are not sufficient as social incentive. You need to give more, and that so far a form of recognition that seems to be running the world since uh, the beginning of ages has been also like compensation, revenue generation from uh, your the, the value you bring as work, as time, et cetera. So the idea of finally empowering creator and rewarding creator, not just 30%, not just 70% or any smaller percentage, but the whole value going back to them when they produce work, when they produce, uh, when they give time is essential. And it's key. It's a, at the center of decentralization. Decentralization of assets. Give, make, play your own content. Then make, play your own economy into those virtual world. Like decentralization of the money, but not more than the money. It's not just a currency we're decentralizing. It's really a UTT token that push into uh, enabling more governance. Like all those virtual world, all those MMOs after 25 years, they have become very political. They are their forum. They have. Uh, they have yield, they have people voting, they are even people striking against some of the decision. Uh, the story of the of uh, Vitalik Buterin is, uh, and the birth of Ethereum is rumored to be linked to like how Activision Blizzard actually yeah. changed the game balance. Changing the game balance is something like developers do all the time. They optimize it too for data driven. But in a decentralized world, is it fair to do so? And that's what I think decentralization is is aiming for. It's like aiming to balance the power and redistribute it towards like the people who make the success and contribute the most to those platforms. And it, it that should be, that's where we're pushing. I think like it's hard in 2021 and specifically as we are at the first stage of implementing it and it's still going to be a long road. We're early in the space, but at least we're trying to build something different uh, <coughs> than well, what we've seen and what we experienced and all the deviance that uh, it generated into in terms of like data tracking privacy uh, and 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 more so uh bruno maybe to to drive the question a little bit in a, in a specific direction do you think uh you know decentralized decentralization is a process that can happen over time and that you know we can start uh, pretty centralized even even if you look at some uh, there are chains right now that are actually very centralized uh, because they think it's, the, it's just the most efficient way to be able to operate currently. Like let's say, let's take Solana for instance, highly centralized. You know, you're uh, they they also say you can't have it all right now, and uh, you have to give up something if you want to go in a direction or another. So, do you think it's because you know, I, I heard about your your critic uh, about about uh, this kind of a centralized layer, even if there's a, a higher goal. Do you think it's a? Do you think this thing can happen over time? 
I mean, sure it can, but it usually doesn't because uh, by then the tech depth is too big and the comfort is too too large to move away from it. Uh, by then they're too used to what they've been doing to actually make such a fundamental change. So I don't think anybody who doesn't start uh, decentralized is actually going to decentralize. Okay. Um, that said, in metaverses in particular, especially in their current format as multiplayer games, they don't actually have to decentralize the running of the engine, even though they could. There are now things like the Fala FAT contract, which can do uh, computational execution for you on chain in the style of iExec and other fog computing methods, where you can actually run the back end of your game on a blockchain. So, in a decentralized way. So, you are actually really free of any kind of server. The problem you run into there is that if you use the current NFT infrastructure, you are again stuck with relying on somebody else to make you those assets. Uh, this is where stuff like like multi-resource NFT, like we have, uh, helps you fully decentralize also the in-game assets. So you have one NFT that has multiple resources, multiple outputs that depend on the on the context that they're being loaded in. Um, this is NFT Lego one. So you have like, maybe you have a board ape that is an NFT, but it also has an alternative resource that is a 3D model. And then it also has an alternative model that is a high fidelity 3D model for a high fidelity game. And then it also has a 2D pixel model for a 2D pixel game. And it's all in one NFT. It's not separate NFTs and it's all connected. And since that NFT can contain other NFTs on our protocol, you can put the experiences you earn in that metaverse into that NFT. So it can have its own level card that is an NFT that collects skills that are NFTs, that collects points and badges. So even the that. animation, the rig, the character rig, for instance, could be an NFT. And so you, you can it basically... Doesn't have to be an NFT. It's an alternative resource. So just another okay. resource on that same NFT. And so on the that same NFT, knows, yeah. Still... yeah the, the, the game knows what it needs to load based on the context. So like you have a multi-resource NFT, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an ebook. That ebook NFT can have a PDF and an audio file and a high resolution cover image all in one. It's one NFT. And if you load it into Kindle, it'll just load the PDF. If you load it into OpenSea, it'll just show you the cover, right? Can it evolve or who is making the content? Like it cannot be all made from the get go, right? So it has to be uh, upgradable right. over time with contribution. Yeah. Right. So in our case, the issuer decides uh, the initial, like when you mint it, you decide what the initial resources are. The issuer then has the ability to propose new resources and the owner of the NFT has to accept it. So this prevents the owner from just changing the NFT to something the else. It also prevents the issuer from rug pulling the owner's uh, art. Okay. That's very well. powerful. Yeah. Very yep. interesting. Uh, kind of a... Um, brings me to uh, to another question which is about really the role of nfts uh in building out the metaverse um because I, I think it's a we're kind of crystallizing a little bit the conversation on that but probably for a good reason because uh of course everybody's we're all trying to figure out this interoperability uh you know challenge and i think we all want it but we understand the limits uh, we'll understand the constraints as well right now to to do that. Uh, you know, I've been a game developer for for 15 years now, and I, I know how challenging it is, even when you're using the same game engine uh, to, to just transfer assets between one project to another. So, but taking some distance from just this specific point, tell me a little bit about the, the role of NFTs for, for you in building out uh, the metaverse. And, and Bruno, uh, let, let's start with you, because of course it's something you, I'm sure you've given a lot of thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've been a gamer for a very long time. And so I, I just, I appreciate, uh, and I've also lost a lot of accounts and lost a lot of progress, not just in games, but also, you know, like you have a sports app, sports watch, you achieve all of these badges, company goes down, all, it all, it's all gone. Um, so to me, like what, how we are building our metaverse is we are going to be decentralized from the start on that, on that fog computing style, uh, kind of fat contract, the, the way it's called. Um, and we are going to be using our multi-resource NFTs and nested NFTs infrastructure uh, from Remark, our standards, to actually make these NFTs um, truly scarce. So to us, it is about ownership of experience. So you can take this avatar and everything it's earned uh, with you. And because it's multi-resource, it is automatically compatible with any other metaverse. And we already have partnerships underway where we have this. So our metaverse is called Skybreach. We have these sky breaches to other metaverses 
where the resource will simply change if you take it into another world. So our world will be like a 2.5D pixel based one. But if you take our avatar into another world and it has a 3D model as its alternative resource, then that model will be shown in that other metaverse. And so we're automatically compatible with everybody else. But the key here is that the NFTs evolve uh, in the game. Uh, like the NFT itself evolves by having these evolving NFTs inside of itself. So it can contain other NFTs. The game will give that NFT its NFTs, not just equipment, not just stuff that you can wear for visual or, or functional changes, but generally you will have an NFT that is an actual brain and you will install crafting recipes into that brain. A crafting recipe is an NFT. You will put that in. Once you have it, your character can craft that specific thing. Um, we also have the concept of world governance, where the entire population of the world has voting power over which new avatar type can be included into the game. So it is decentralized from the beginning. Now, there's a totally real chance that it gets completely destroyed by the community um, because the community goes crazy. They decide, let's see how much damage we can do. And that is a risk that we're willing to take. But right. this is an experiment in the true open metaverse. And this is uh, how we think. <clears throat> NFTs, taking them out of the game, out of the experience, and into other experiences where these new experiences can respect the past of the NFT. Thanks. The the, the thing is that uh, what I'm trying to understand is, is sorry, go ahead, Tim. No, no. Uh, well, well, I think that like what it boils down to a lot, like is like it's all technology. It's a lot of technology to put in place, and um, where we're aiming towards it seems it's like nfts are in a way self-hosted decentralized application on their own they contain the data they manage the logic they manage uh, even uh, the permission over that they will give to certain application and where they are being used uh, the client are such some hosts that would require wallets to connect to allow those interaction and, and be respectful of uh, what's been defined into the nft to interact and, and I, this is a very interesting paradigm and that it shows like um, this cannot be achieved by current tech. Like if I take any existing virtual world, all the Minecraft, the Roblox, the Fortnite, don't, let's not even talk about them. Like, well, it's one galaxy far away today. Maybe the existing decentralized world would implement it if it's based on, uh, like you said, uh, like uh, uh, existing technologies that didn't accumulate too much technical depth. So the decentralized and the summary of space and potentially sandbox as well. And we look, we like to look into it, like how would it work, etc. So, so we could plug this kind of content. Um, overall, it, it's um, it's a lot of effort to program one NFT. It, it makes like the NFT content creation almost like a whole application production at this time. You have to, to, to think and incorporate much more than just the content. You have multiple forms of content, logic, etc. cetera. Um, governance rights, uh, the rules of uh, crafting, the rule of upgrading, the rule of the game balance of that NFT. You have to think that balance across multiple possible applications to make sure like it's uh, not going to become unfair to play with an NFT into another game that would allow you to, 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 I don't know, to loot or to upgrade much faster than somewhere else. Those are new design challenge, definitely. And, and it's interesting, it, very few game developers or game designers are actually prepared for like the disruption of the logic that we're preparing for here because they are all creating application as those like, um, dictators you know like game designers are often called dictators they decide all the rules of their world or their apps and they really very are not keen on on giving over that power to the community to let that community decide and make the thing evolve on their own that's um so, so my, that, that my takeaway is like we need new skills it's not only built on tech but it's also built on new skills and probably a new kind of audience to progressively adapt into that whole logic that whole paradigm until it will become fully mainstream. And for reaching that, there's probably a few steps in the middle to still try to bridge toward that ultimate end goal uh, that we're trying to accomplish. And I'm, I'm glad that we're we're talking today, like the very interesting conversation is bringing a lot of like very valuable feedback and light that we don't usually get on, on uh, all the panels. We are only focusing on NFT value. Um, Thank you very much. And I think that it's, it's, it can trigger uh, so many additional questions and, and maybe we'll, we'll go back to, uh, to NFTs. Um, 
but I'd like to try to to because the metaverse is not just NFTs. The NFT is the apparently is the asset that are going to uh, they're really driving the dynamic there. But there are all very stakeholders, right? I, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, um, DAOs because I think it's uh, they they start to become a more a, a bigger and bigger uh, focus on. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to to find a good way to express that, but Web three and blockchain is about um, putting kind of, it's about fairness for all the stakeholders, and so instead of creating this completely unbalanced relationship uh, that you guys have kind of meant, uh, uh, mentioned in a way, you know, between the developer, the publisher, the operators, and users, uh, right now we get this much more balanced relationship uh, between all of these uh, actors of the, the these experiences these services um, how do you think that DAO like how, what is for you the importance of DAOs in the development of the the open metaverse uh, let's start let's start with with you James uh, sure so uh, I, I think DAO is really important uh, I it's actually a very I mean, you know, for, for, for crypto industry in front of the beginning, right? It, it's like, a, uh, let, let's, let's go back to 2017. You, you got like, a, um, you know, there's no decision. Basically the most important thing lack here is there's no decision making process. So, I mean, uh, you have like a Bitcoin committee disagree with each other. So they came out like a Bitcoin cash. And from the beginning you have a certain don't, uh, committee don't disagree with each other. They, uh, you know, kind of have a certain classes. So later on, there's still a lot of debate in the in the, in this kind of community, and then you know because of lack of decision making process, so a lot of things are not building yet and very very slow in, in making the progress. So that's a problem. So I think DAO is actually a very good and important ways to solve the problem. Is like, a, oh, okay, so here's a decentralized decision making process. Then you know everyone you know every stakeholders can. Can, can agree on a process, then we, we just vote for that. So that's actually solved a lot of, you know, I, I would say the governance kind of uh, problem in, uh, in the crypto industry for the long term. So in, in the metaverse, I think that's that's basically the, the, the same thing. So eventually you will, you, you will need a DAO that to, to kind of design as a, uh, as, a, as a kind of decision-making process in the metaverse. So that's actually uh, same in the metaverse and same in the crypto industry. So that's my understanding why I think we, we need a DAO in, in the long term. Interesting. So um, Sebastian, what, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys are interacting with some, some of them today uh, who are stakeholders of the sandbox, the, the sandbox world. So how, how important for you, is it just a, some, it's just an, a, a new way of communities to organize, or is it like critical? Is it the central part in a way of this whole uh, new paradigm? In terms of DAOs, um, so right now, most of the DAOs I've seen are like sharing a common interest around like asset ownership and around like, uh, in a way, revenue, education and revenue generation. Like, let me make it's a little bit more clear like either guilds of players are uh, forming together they are providing scholarship program they are leveraging the assets to uh, generate a revenue yield and then maximize the outcome of it by uh, getting uh, more trained by multiplying the number of players and splitting in the pool the revenue they generate that's an interesting approach that definitely that you, sometimes you could say it's farming, but in another way it's also, uh, and it has been existing before, but it's been done in a decentralized manner and with the educational aspect of it that bring a, a great amount of players, which would have, might be have not been into this kind of gameplay before or never into uh, interested into gaming. So it's pushing the boundaries of gaming into new agencies. And uh, it's been done at scale. We've seen like uh, that much scale that some countries have been leading in the space and they've been known for leading the play to earn and uh, gaming uh, for that. I think it's uh, definitely interesting uh, to interact with DAOs as they hold that power to, of distribution, of reach uh, for uh, your game, to think your gameplay, to think your rules, to think how they can interact with your game so you can mutually benefit from each other. The other DAOs we've seen is more, um, uh, is, is not necessarily like uh, NFT or yield generated, um, but they are more into like content creation side. Like, okay, we want to bring 
new artists to light. We want to make them discovered. So how do we better leverage application marketplaces and metaverses to uh, get uh, new talent discovered and offer uh, better opportunities for artists who otherwise would struggle in the space. That's also uh, something that we're trying to help with at some point. Ultimately, um, we haven't seen yet uh, DAO that are uh, voting more into the governance or the identity yeah. questions. Uh, that's an area that I'm really keen on personally. Um, we interested of the question of like, how we build a better world. That's the topic of uh, this panel today in Metaverse. In my opinion, it starts with identity, it starts with avatar, how you choose to be uh, the person you are into the virtual world, how you look, your nickname, not just the first name, last name, and the photo of you, uh, and how people will perceive you no matter of your ethnicity, your origin, the country you live in, the education you receive, or the situation the political situation of your country of, or the situation of your parents. It's putting more equality, more fan share, fair chances at the beginning. And then with governance, with DAO, we can enforce that fair chances to remain in place if we're able to, to provide a democratic way to, 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 to influence or to govern the decision of the world. Uh, even though it's still always a challenge on like how you balance the voting power, is it uh, we all know that whoever owns the more NFT into uh, a community is not the most democratic way to do it. But how do you balance then between like contribution, reputation, and ownership? In this case, it's still, in my opinion, um, a work in progress process. So, so in a way, we're we're still at a very, uh, <coughs> uh, I'd say, pragmatic or down to earth stage of DAOs, which are. You know they have a very kind of a short-sighted not, not in a negative way but a goal which is you know either a capitalistic you know let's generate profit and make sure that we uh, uh that we can collectively invest in in assets and, and turn the and turn some uh, some revenue out of it education that's what you're <clears throat> what you were saying and um and and just uh, creators gathering to be a bit stronger but they're we're not there yet where we have these political uh, drivers that can really uh, like, uh, you know, bring people together based on values and, and really like more like a, uh, a deeper philosophies of, uh, of how things should be. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Bruno, what's your what's your view on that? Because uh, also, I remember you said that you, you started uh, you started your, your whole venture out of frustration. So. Uh, what have you uh, what have you experienced there? Well, in terms of DAOs, we are again thinking about um, moving the needle a little bit away from you know the current simp DAOs and whatever's popular right now. Like you have these various you know groups of people who make a DAO, which is neither decentralized nor autonomous. It is just a group of token holders um, that that really don't do anything. Um, they just collaborate on Discord and make bids on real world items. This is not a DAO. Um, what we want to do is bring DAOs into into people's like, you know, if you think of this as a parallel life, as a life beyond, um, you then you kind of see it as as something that people want to govern collectively. And this this can span this can be very local and also it can be very global. So for the global side, we have the world governance where everybody who's participating in the world has a vote in it. But also locally, we have another NFT Lego where you can actually fractionalize every NFT into fungible tokens if you deposit some, some of those remark tokens to, to do this. Um, this is a spam prevention method. But uh, the, the point here is that you're not fractionalizing it like you do in Ethereum right now for the purpose of gambling. Um, you're fractionalizing it to own the tokens and then to collectively govern that NFT as a DAO. So the NFT becomes a DAO, and because the NFTs have so much functionality, like adding new resources, switching resource priority, uh, equipping and unequipping items, adding and removing children, um, using an NFT in a sp specific way, triggering a special function on it, uh, the token holders of that NFT can then decide which function on the NFT to call. And so you now have um, NFTs that are governable by their uh, share, like shared token holders. Uh, which is extremely applicable in a metaverse environment like you have this uh, we have this canonical example of a, of a billboard where if you have since all of our land 
is an NFT and a building is an NFT that is equipped into a land and an avatar is equipped into a building, which means that you cannot use this avatar in any other metaverse while it is equipped in a metaverse NFT already. Um, this nesting infrastructure allows you to also govern these nested items. Like if you have a piece of land and then you have a billboard on that piece of land, that billboard can be tokenized. And so the owners of those billboard tokens will decide who gets to put an ad up there. Um, so there's a lot of these different use cases that, that, make, that become possible when you fractionalize NFTs in a useful way and not in a way to just, you know, gamble with tokens and, and make a profit. So, so does it mean well, that... Sorry, sorry, Seb. Go ahead. I have a question to uh, to understand how this. Me, me, me too. Uh, actually, because that that raised the thoughts, uh, a few thoughts here. Like first, the billboard, if it's an NFT, uh, like the revenue generated should also go to to the community and not just uh, the decision of what to put on it. But um, maybe we do not want too much billboards in the metaverse. By way of fact, <laughs> let's avoid that. As the only uh, way to to think of monetization there. Um, Ultimately, lands and FTs, they are infrastructure. And that's the way I see it. Like Sandbox is a game maker with land, with a map. Uh, anyone could begin building its own game maker. Anyone could begin building a new representation or interpretation over what's on the land. We provide one form of utility on top of it to provide, uh, to, to kick things off. I was going to, I was starting to think and pushing a little bit in the direction you were saying, like, what if we actually use Game Maker to allow any other decentralized virtual world to have utility on their own land, like taking some space lands, that decentralized land, and let them build and represent onto the land they own something else, something sandbox made. That idea, uh, it doesn't sound unreasonable, right? That anyway, that, like you own the land, you own the token, you could publish on it if you want. And that's um, a very that's a paradigm that we have to consider because I'm not sure if I'm the only one starting to have these kind of ideas here on, on this panel in general, or it's um, it's something like broader that also comes from the community having these kind of needs. And and uh, and my question to understand better, Bruno, what you what you were saying is, does it mean that every NFT? would be uh, would have its own token as well because then how the DAO would be able to govern their the future um, of that nft so every nft can have its own token so the owner of an nft can turn it into fungible tokens if they deposit some remark tokens this is a spam prevention method and then so this prevents fungible token spam but every nft that you have you can turn into governable into fractionalized tokens whether or not there's any interest in that it's entirely up to you and the market but we support this functionality as kind of like a, one of those Legos that I mentioned. Okay. And so people can do this if they have NFTs that they think. So will... that's how your, your governance would be, would be right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we have a, a few more minutes. Um, and <clears throat> I, think, I think something that, 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 that people uh, that are listeners here might be very interested to know is also to understand how, you know, we're, Sometimes it feels like what we're doing is a little bit too much between ourselves. Um, you know, it's still a very close and, and, and I mean, not really close, but it's a niche community, uh, mostly because the entry barrier is pretty high. And, um, and of course, what we're trying to figure out to, to that together is what it's going to, what it's going to take, you know, to, to, to get out of this uh, uh, connoisseur world to, uh, to a, a more mainstream uh, audience. I would like to, so one way I, I don't want to I don't want to ask you and, and go to into too many directions how it's, this is going to happen but uh, let's focus a little bit on like large companies you know we if we think of like the big players out there and I'm not just talking about Facebook and Google and Amazon let's just uh, uh, be uh, see a bit wider do, do you how do you think like do you think these companies are basically going to create their their own uh, uh, private gardens, uh, you know, within this space where they're going to try to uh, uh, bring this most more like a massive audience and but try to lock them within these worlds? Or how do you think these big companies are going to uh, interact uh, with with this world? And I know Sandbox, for instance, has already, has already built a, a, a great number of partnership with, uh, with brands and companies from the physical world. So, so, so tell us a little bit, Seb. Uh, 
Uh, Sebastian, did you hear us? Yes, uh, well, uh, sorry. Um, we um, we're trying to to be again that bridge towards more of the mainstream, and the way we're achieving that is essentially through uh, two things. One being uh, creators friendly with uh, the accessibility of our tools, like Voxedit. Uh, Voxel is a very accessible form. We were the first to enable to have like an open free editor that does animation. Uh, the no code game maker as well has shown like it can bring new people, non professional, into uh, like. Uh, not just game making, experience making. And we've been supporting that through many game jams, with, which helped to discover new talent, talent that became entrepreneur today and run their own game studio, hiring 10, 20 people or more. Uh, we also have been uh, from the early days, and that comes from our background, uh, 10 years of gaming, UGC and uh, brands, is we brought brands into the metaverse. We brought uh, Adidas, Walking Dead, uh, um, even Snoop Dogg, Dead Mao, et cetera. Some are, uh, uh, and, and they, we, we always try to do it in a meaningful way for their fans, for their community, for the thing that uh, they believe, uh, we believe could bring value to them uh, and not be short-sighted. And we're in a way also defining a new form of entertainment. Through the fans, through that 1 billion people reach globally, doesn't mean like 1 billion, 1 billion people will jump straight in, but progressively they are becoming more and more aware, more and more educated about uh, the possibility that decentralization brings. We also put a lot of effort into supporting like bootcamp, academic program, run and earn campaign among a lot of exchanges towards uh, like, general awareness of web3 and i think it's starting to to show some results very interesting J james uh you you're kind of like our macro uh analyst here you have a as an investor i'm sure you have a you, you think a lot about what's happening in the next few years and how these big players are going to jump in yeah sure thank you um what we viewed is that at the beginning, I think, you know, especially in the uh, DeFi industry, there's only about crypto native project because uh, they have very kind of serious uh, regulations on the financial industry. So it's almost impossible for the big company in the financial industry to move into space. So it's only about crypto native project. Uh, but when, you know, uh, NFT and uh, uh, gaming in the middle has become popular, uh, we see more kind of, you know, from the beginning, it's still about crypto crypto native project uh, become very, very popular. But, but gradually we will see a lot of um, new uh, big companies in these sectors come into place and do the project. Uh, it, it, it's just because like, there's less like, regulation there, they, can, they are ready to move into space and do so. Uh, uh, but still one thing is uncertain, whether these kind of uh, big companies can successfully building the crypto native project by themselves, or they have to work with other crypto native project to 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 uh, to uh work with. Time. Yeah, yeah, well, partnership. So that is still unclear. But but at least one trend is clear in, in this specific industry, other than DeFi, and we will see more uh big companies moving to the space. And Bruno, and then we'll uh, then we'll we'll have to conclude and wrap it up. Um, yeah, again, we're, we're, we're moving in a different direction here in that we think that it's kind of a mistake uh, at this early stage to focus on 3D metaverses because you then get um, kind of the worst of, of both worlds. You get gamers, which are not a huge audience, and you get... Uh, which is not a huge audience? Uh, I mean, they're a huge audience, but not in terms of... Three billion of, players in the world, that's pretty big. Not, not in the mainstream uh, idea that, that you're talking about on bringing the mainstream. Like, if you talk about the, the Facebook metaverse or something else, these are not the people who are going to sit down behind a desktop and fire up a 3D environment. Um, they don't feel comfortable in WASD movement. They don't, they, they're just not at home in these 3D environments. They're more at home in Stardew Valley-like environments with 2.5D pixel uh, that they can fire up while they're, you know, uh, sitting on a toilet or waiting for a bus. And this is, um, this is what we are focusing on. Now, granted, as a gamer, I'm, I'm present in all of the 3D environments and um, I, I, I enjoy all games, um, but... I see the next, the next, you know, I don't know how many billion users uh, coming on board through a more hyper casual experience 
and then onboarding them slowly into the other stuff rather than relying on the expertise of gamers who will then have to also gather the expertise of NFTs and mix that complicated uh, crock pot of technology into something that they understand and evangelize. I think that's a harder route to take than to get people on board of a Stardew Valley-like game that they can casually fire up and log out of, but uses NFTs without exposing them to NFT and then slowly ease them into it. So this is the approach that, that we are taking for the next billion or whatever users. Great. Well, um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you very much for your, uh, your very educated insight. I think it's, uh, it's very interesting to see. I, I think that probably to conclude uh, my feeling after hearing all of your position uh, and also knowing a little bit of my own uh, is that, you know, we're still at a very early stage. Everything is, uh, I think the, the scale, people think because of the scale of the, you know, the big dollars that we're talking about, that it's already so far advanced, but I think all of us here, we know that it's very much the beginning, even when we're talking about players, for instance, it's still very niche, you know, we're talking about 3 million blockchain players, which is ridiculously low uh, compared to the 3 billion out there. Um, so, so it's very interesting to, again, see it, uh, witness this kind of conversation with the, a very, uh, this open mindedness. So I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for joining us and participating today. And uh, I hope, uh, I hope everybody will enjoy it. I did a lot. So uh, I wish you all uh, great success in your uh, in your ventures and great success in your investments, uh, James. And uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, our next one. Thank you all. Thank you. I have a question for Thank you. you. Me. Can I ask? Sorry, you, you have a question. Yeah, is life beyond integrating blockchain and NFTs? Yeah, absolutely. Nice, awesome. <laughs> yeah, we we will we will make more we will make more. Uh, uh, announcement soon about where where we're going, but uh, we've been working hard on that for 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 some time now. Very cool, awesome. Thank you all. We'll speak soon again, hopefully. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Bye. Very interesting discussion. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.